It is an absolute joy for us to welcome Professor Philip Clayton with us. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, Philip. Thank you so much. Thank you for having uh, me. We um, have looked at the number of your, your books and listened to many of your resources online and so appreciate just your desire to take ideas that are usually kind of confined to the academia and communicate it in a way that brings life uh, and beauty to to people in every walk mm -hmm. of life i'm going to just jump in as well with that um thought that you know so many of the people that we've encountered over the years that have perhaps grown up very either fundamental or um evangelical whatever their background has been have maybe been exposed to science or different questions and they've begun to question some of their fundamental beliefs and often as a result they either feel guilty about it or feel like they have to choose and um, I so appreciate the way that you engage in conversation and that you find questions valuable <laughs> to a developing faith um, why The most personal and true response is that my second conversion was a conversion to the questions. Okay. Uh, so I was raised in an atheist family, and at 14, I had a very dramatic conversion to Jesus Christ. So I would, uh, there was no question about before and after. It was a, it was a Damascus Road experience, and, and that set the direction of my life. But um, I moved into the Christian options that were available to me, which was um, very conservative evangelical, actually fundamentalist. I wasn't sure we should read any book except the Bible, period. Um, and, um, and Pentecostal, which also was theologically very conservative. Um, and I chose a conservative Christian college, Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, which was a place at that time that held an inerrantist view of scripture. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, there were some things that were difficult for me in the things I was being told. My heart was open to it, but my mind was struggling a bit. Yes. And the moment of my second conversion, I say that in quotes, right? I mean, it's, yeah. but it, it does explain why I've spent my life the way I have. Uh, I chose to be a philosophy major because philosophy, they said, would help me preach more clearly. That was my only reason for choosing philosophy. I didn't know anything about it, I suppose. And in my third year as a junior, we were in, in a class with our, our most beloved philosophy of religion teacher, Stan Obitz. There were about 23 of us, young, bright-eyed students sitting there, and he was walking us through Leibniz and his view on God. We were all leaning forward in our chairs and um, asking questions, and he was answering, and we were engaging this material. And there was an excitement in the room. Uh, and I, with these doubts that I could hardly even name at the time, was equally engaged. And there was this one moment, I'll never forget, when Stan Ovitz leaned forward, he had this way of kind of holding his hands in front of his face like this. And, and he said, he said, he stopped us with his hands. And then he said, these are the questions. <laughs> and I got it. Yeah. The questioning was actually more important than anything Leibniz said, mm -hmm. or anything that Spinoza or, you know, all these different philosophers said. And that if you were led by the questions, you could get where you needed to go. Yeah. So I, I, my Christian commitment is strong and clear to me. Yeah. And I've sought over the last decades to live those questions. Yeah. That is so beautiful. And, and how, you know, we've discussed our questions draw us forward. Um, and, and so much of, you know, we, we desire this conversation, that people are open to conversation between science, religion. Like, like you were saying, the questions are so important. The, the dialogue is so important. And often in our particular field, maybe in religion, there are these walls and boxes that we create that we very much, we, we want to keep within that. And then maybe in the, in the scientific side, there's also you can be fundamental in both sides or both ways mm -hmm. um and it seems to me you know the way jesus lived was a very open without walls conversation 
Um, and it, 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 it just feels like that is the way you approach this conversation and this dialogue between mm -hmm. science and religion. Yeah, I have the privilege of teaching theology at a Methodist seminary, and I'm John Wesley is very much an orienting figure for, mm -hmm. for me as well, uh, among others. Uh, and uh, so one of the classes I get to teach is um, the Jesus class. So Chris, it's called Christology in seminary, but it's basically the, the school's Jesus class. And um, I begin and end uh, with Jesus in Matthew 16. So it's an exciting time. There's lots of energy. The disciples come up and, um, uh, you know, talk about all the um, things they're hearing about who Jesus might be Elijah and might be Moses and so forth. And then, and then he just pauses in Matthew 16, 15, and he says, but who do you say that I am? Mm. And then that leads Peter to the, his confession. So we begin and end the class. The first day of the class is the whole class is Jesus' question to you. Yes. And in this class, I'm not going to police the answers, but we'll come back again and again to Jesus' question. Mm. So kids, future ministers in my classes get to search for an entire semester, the history of thought about Jesus, all the theologies, all the scriptures, but coming back again every week to the same question, but who do you say? And you are required, you know, on the first day, your final paper will be an attempt to answer that question that Jesus poses to each of, each of us. Wow. I think that's Jesus' way of teaching, isn't it? Yes. I love it. <laughs> teaching with questions, because in many of our faith communities, there seems to be a nervousness about questions and uh, protectionism of once you start questioning too many things and doubting too many things, uh, that's going to lead you into the wrong direction. And personally, I remember one period in my life where I, I started questioning some of the beliefs that I held for a very <laughs> long time. And it eventually led me to the place where I really doubted that the God I believed in before is, mm -hmm. is even real. And I remember at that point walking out into the garden and just praying. And, and in that moment of just reaching out, I felt such a overwhelming sense of God's embrace to, to assure me that these questions is not something he's offended with, mm. but rather it's almost like God making room for himself. God saying, hey, your ideas of who I am are too small. And if you want to experience me in a way you haven't experienced me before, doubt can be divine. It can actually start breaking down those boundaries that you've created conceptually so that faith can reach beyond those boundaries and take hold of possibilities that you have not considered before. I, I know that you also appreciate the fact that the doubt is part of the process of faith. Um, can you explore that a bit, Philip? Yeah, that was one one of the biggest transformations, I suppose, in my lived experience of Christian faith, is that I, in the early years, I was taught and believed that doubt was a sin. Mm. Uh, and so when the doubts would come, then you, you'd confess that you were a sinful person. Um, well, that makes it really hard to deal with the doubts if, if every time they come, that in, in and of itself is an evil thing. Um, and it also, what it does is it makes us really rigid because we feel we're trying, our, our brains just are, give us a thousand possibilities. We are questioning animals by nature. And when we're fighting off every question, as if the mere arising of a question is a sin, yeah. then we become more and more rigid and tight. It leads us to act in a non-loving way toward others. Yes. Because their open questioning and conversation can feel to us like confrontation. Yes. And it makes us very uncomfortable in our relationship with God. Yes. Because we have to say, well, I've got him all figured out. Yes. It's this and this. And any other thought is sin. And there was a time when I realized that the questioning mind is a gift of God. Mm. To live in the world with the questions. 
isn't it a different mode of being in the world altogether? Absolutely. What, what liberty when you suddenly realize that my security doesn't lie in the fact that I'm right. Mm. It lies in the fact that I'm loved, whether I'm right or wrong. <laughs> yeah. and, and that there's this pulling forward any dynamic relationship, most of all a relationship with a being of such tremendous infinite possibilities will draw us into areas that we haven't explored before, will open us to wonder. Now, one of the things that I want to get into specifically in this, in this sense of wonder, um, we, we have an online school, Mimesis Academy, and over the past year, we, we use a number of different models to look at how we can understand and appreciate the presence of God in our world. And one of the philosophical perspectives that we used in this past year is process philosophy. Now, I know it's a huge area, uh, but I also appreciate the fact that there might be a way, and this is my question to you, is there a way in which you can summarize how process philosophy helps us understand the presence or the imminence of God in our world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what if I entered into it through a kind of Trinitarian way of thinking about process thought? Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm on the, the, the edge of process thought, which is more happy to, to call itself open and relational theology. Yes. So I just cards on the table. I'm not the full Whiteheadian view. Yeah. Um, my colleague Tom Ward and several others are much more the and full Whiteheadian Claremont, where I teach, is associated with full Whiteheadian Christian thinkers like John Cobb and David Griffin. Yes. Uh, and and I'm looking much more for bridging use of process. Uh, and we could later go into the technicalities of my differences with them. But let's let's just think think our way into process in a Trinitarian way. First, we have. God the origin, or the tradition says God the Father, who is infinite creativity and whose creativity sparkles in everything around us. Yeah. Then we have God manifested through human beings and, and for us as Christians at, at the highest level through Jesus Christ. And that's God the giver of grace. God who shows God's self as one absolutely unlimited grace upon grace, yeah. love upon love. The nature of God revealed to me in its in its quintessential form in that way, and then we have God as presence, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit classically, uh, and that is God always going before, or John fourteen Paraclete, the one who comes alongside. Yes. Um, so that means, for example, with questioning and doubt, when I walk into a room, a question, a situation, the room is already filled with the Spirit of God. Yes. This God's always completely present. This is not a space outside of God. Uh -huh. And the, this is part of the living. Uh, I have a book uh, I published some years ago called In Whom We Live and Move and Have Our Being, Acts 1729. This is the space in whom, the divine space in whom we live. Yes. Process tries to bring those themes to the top. Mm -hmm. So understanding God as infinite creativity, understanding God as um, the one who interacts with us, always luring and drawing us toward the image of God in Christ, and then the one who's always already there. Yes. So it take this con this moment in this conversation is taken up into the divine being. This is how process teaches it, and then God sends back to us in the very next instant a lure toward the most that this conversation can be. Hmm. Now, there are limitations. Uh, you know, I didn't, don't remember a page of Whitehead's thought or something. And so there are certain things God can't get me to do. I wanted to quote page 469, but I don't remember it, you know. So, <laughs> the thing, but God can still lure me in the direction yes. of that, of the way that I can be ideal. Yes. So that would be my short bridging between Trinitarian thought and a process theological worldview. Yeah. 
I really appreciate that. And and I know that um, Joseph Bracken also has a beautiful way of uh, opening up a way of understanding the Trinity with a slightly adjusted kind of process view of society as well. One of the things that has been of great benefit to in our conversation with our students this year is, is to even appreciate the, the scientific philosoph philosophical validation of our sins of God's presence. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that we explored together with, with process thought is just some of the quantum physics ideas of the principle of uncertainty, the, the idea that there's possibility built into the very fabric of reality. And that the scientific idea that everything is predetermined ha has not been empirically proven. In fact, it seems like there's more and more evidence that possibility is part of the fabric mm -hmm. of our world, that there's a continual, even in evolution, there's a continual upward movement to, to greater diversity, greater novelty. And that kind of language, uh, I think process thought has given us a way of speaking exactly what you said now, a God that is not intervening in our world from time to time, a God that doesn't watch us from a distance, but a God that is constantly present, even when we're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. Now, that you touched on it, that idea that God is the lure. God presents us with possibilities from moment to moment to become. How does that understanding, how does that affect you in your daily life? What, what does that mean to you in the way you live? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it means that moving into each new situation, the next meeting I have, the next book I need to read and teach, I am asked to look for and respond in ways that are not predetermined. Mm. <laughs> I, there is not the one right answer for me to give, but when I walk into the classroom on Tuesday evening, a moment will happen that's unique in the history of the world. Wow. These 12 students and I talking about a text, maybe one that's been discussed millions of times, maybe a new one, can lead to an emerging moment mm. that has the potential to be transformative for all 13 of us mm. uh, in the room. There's a, a, a Whitehead uses the expression creative transformation. Mm. And I like to think of the ongoing work of God as the lure toward creative transformation. Mm. Mm. I'm a strong doctrine of sin. So nobody in the room is perfect, especially not the professor. <laughs> but we can, I can be transformed through what they may say. Yes. And uh, there's so many examples I can think, but all of us know that when life is kind of attuned or a conversation is attuned, you sense that it's taking you new places that you didn't predict in advance. Wow. Right? I mean, I think that we share that sense of yes. what life can be when there's a constant creative transformation yes. at work. And it's, and it's so beautiful mm. because it's not just a case of, you know, just regurgitating the same old things and the same old faults. The, the, it really gives the opportunity for, like you say, for novelty, for for another possibility of interpreting this event of affecting mm. one another and i think not only affecting one another but the idea that we can affect god <laughs> that exactly. that for me is just a, such mm. a beautiful um thing because it's relational yeah yeah, yeah. i i am um, i'm thinking as well We've only got a few minutes left. My goodness, we so enjoy. We, we'll have to do this again, hopefully. <laughs> but in the last few minutes, 
Philip, one of the questions that we've worked with as well in looking from a process view, which is a theistic view, which doesn't have anything specific to say about Christology or the Jesus class from, from Whitehead's point of view. It's a much more generic understanding. What uh, would you say about the uniqueness of the event of incarnation? the uniqueness of Jesus with this understanding that God has always been present in the world. Yeah. God has always given opportunities and possibilities to every person. And in that sense, I greatly appreciate that Jesus doesn't come as an alien invading our world, showing us something that we can never be, but Ravi comes to unveil something that has been present and continues to be present. So I appreciate our ability to identify with Jesus. But what is it that is unique in that event uh, and therefore unique in the Christian message? Yeah. Um, there's a stereotype that um, process theology means low Christology. So, uh, you know, not emphasizing the uniqueness of Jesus. In fact, there's this huge spectrum. On the low side uh, are people like Monica A. Coleman, who, who says, I have a very low Christology. On the high side are um, people like myself. Um, Tom Ward has a high Christology, and um, Trip Fuller mm -hmm. has a very high Christology. Um, this is something that I've been working on with my co-author, Steve Knapp, just recently. You've just published an article in Zygon uh, magazine uh, recently, the journal, and uh, are working on a new book. Um, and so the, the hard part for Christology at the beginning is that a process thinker wouldn't start with an eternal mandate of God. So, and wouldn't start with substance dualism, mm -hmm. which means that uh, all the, the essences already are um, established in advance and then they're just imposed upon the world in a predetermined form. Yeah. So process doesn't go that way. We don't think the world is that way. Um, but that doesn't preclude the uh, very high Christology. So here's, here's how we, we see it, uh, my co-author and I, um, that um, there, were, there are times that God knows, but God may not be a full predictor of future human decisions, but God can know that there are certain times which are, um, the possible dawn of the new epoch yeah. and the time of the so-called axial age when Christianity was born was that kind of time. Yeah, reminds and, me of Ephesians 1, that in the fullness of yeah. time, there was that precise exactly. moment, yeah. Nice, nice. And that the history of the Jewish people had led to, and that we could talk about if we had more time, it led to uh, this, this kind of um, kairos moment, yeah. a moment which is a the launch of a new epoch, as Ephesians 1 describes. And um, so as Jesus was born, there was, there was much hope <laughs> among the angels in heaven. And what happened is that Jesus responded fully and perfectly to every lure and guiding of God. Hmm. Um, and not because God had made the world so and was going to intervene constantly to fix it, but because here, the harmony for which God had created in the first place, yes. the harmony between humans and God, was actualizing in just the way that God had hoped and pulled all of history to that 13.8 billion years God had been working at this. Yes. And now it was like it was going just the way it needed to go. There, was, there were risks. There were risks. But as moment by moment, day by day, through those the 30 years of preparation and the three years of public ministry, God was watching. But not only that, God was actually learning what the creation could be hmm. as it was now fully incarnated in a person. And I, for me, Luke 22 in the Garden of Gethsemane is one of the most important verses for Christology. Um, the, the earliest Christian hymn that we have in Philippians 2 is for me the absolute guiding one mm. that Jesus, who although he was in the full form of God, didn't count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. The verb ekinosin 
is um, that leads to the noun kenosis. So it's a kenosis, a self-emptying of God so that God can be all in all, so yeah. that Jesus can be all in all. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus lives that as a human being mm. and goes to pray. The disciples fall asleep and he says, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Mm. I believe that in every instant of Jesus' life, he actually lived that. Not my will, but thine be done. Mm. Through up to and through the cross. And at that I don't know when, was it at birth? Was it in, during his ministry? Was it in the last 24 hours of his life? I believe that a perfect fusion occurred yeah. of divine will and human will, which had been the goal of creation from the first moment. Yes. In that perfect fusion, which led then to the death and the resurrection, Jesus became, as Paul says, the firstborn of all creation. Yeah. That's insane. I mean, how many billions and billions of living beings have been born on how many planets, right? Yeah. But in one sense, in this sense, he was the firstborn of all creation yes. because the will of God not to control, but to work in harmony with these creatures yeah. sharing one will yeah. Yeah. occurred. That's Beautiful. my result. Beautiful. I... I so enjoy, uh, even from an Al Jaradian perspective, the the role that desire and reflective desire plays. And, and so even though we could see God present in all of creation and God working with all of human beings before that uh, and presenting them with possibilities moment from moment, that process whereby jesus says i have not come to do my own will but i only do the will of my father i i only do what i see my father doing it's something about the reflective desire within the consciousness of jesus came to that place to say i'm gonna see my abba and that's a way that my whole life my desire reflects that that as well um oh there's so many beautiful things we've been stirred by by your thoughts and uh, yeah. uh, thank you so much philip i'm gonna watch this just for enjoyment a few times <laughs> after this I know that it's gonna be a blessing to our yes. audience as well thank you for your time well thank you Andrew. thank you mary it's really really been a pleasure and many blessings on your ministry and to thank all your students you. thank you